generating a little. Loans and credits, we are going to discuss that as well later. There are different ways of getting extra resources. Development banks are very active to fund programs uh, with economic, for economic development. Um, actually, in space, most of these uh, development banks are more national. They are programs sponsored by European, uh, European uh, Bank of Investment or, um, or uh, the World Bank, but of a lower, lower scale. Vendor financing, where the vendor basically lends the money to the customer in exchange of equity or debt. And then uh, uh, the vendor is using this money to uh, buy and to procure the, the asset. That has been especially applied by China in many countries, in several countries. Uh, Russia and Angola, and export credit agencies, which has been, ECS have been, as you know, very active in the commercial sector, uh, such as Exim, uh, BPI, uh, former COFAS, but not so much for emerging programs financing, essentially for asset procurement. <clears throat> so basically, all these models have for um, the loans and credits have, uh, for objective to bridge the gap when traditional finance, uh, financing schemes uh, cannot, uh, are, are not applicable or are difficult to uh, uh, to be implementing, so they are bridging the gap. And um, it's a good enabler as well for technology transfer because most of the time there is uh, all these financial uh, uh, support mechanisms are coupled with technology transfers. Last but not least, commercial revenues. That's, I think, an important area uh, where we might discuss as well in the panel. It becomes increasingly popular, but it's not so easy to implement. It's not that straightforward. Basically, the objective here in the commercial reviews is for the government agencies to sell the capacity of the asset it has procured and the market, whether it's capacity for SETCOM or earth observation data and so on. So the idea is to get some return on investment. Uh, it complements the baseline budget, depends, it limits the dependencies uh, with respect to the regular funding, and it showcases as well the uh, return on investment for the government because obviously national governments are more and more uh, pushing for, uh, to, to, to get concrete return on investment, in, in, including in emerging, for emerging programs. However, it has re strong requirements, ability to reach customers, market access is really not easy, especially when, you're not, when you are a new entrant. And it means to uh, build a new in-house sales team or to have some partner agreements. Historical agencies have been used to commercialize and to get some commercial return from an investment. Uh, CNES, for instance, used to do that with some uh, uh, subsidiaries, such as Potimash, for instance, but if you take the example of Israel with Antrix, that's basically what the objective is, uh, or Glass Cosmos, actually, with, with uh, Roscosmos. So the objective is to, is to have a spin-off, basically, you often say spin-off, it's a specific commercial ventures, commercializing the services, and to get some, some return on investment. For a new entrant, it's very not easy. It's not so easy. A lot of new countries are trying to do it. And i just put here some uh, examples, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, and so on, with more, more or less successes, uh, either to sell data or to sell on the, uh, capacity, the, the, tele, uh, the capacity they are on on their telecom satellites. Um, but it proved, it proved that it's very long time consuming, and it's not so easy for any new entrant to build a commercial strategy uh, when, uh, when they start a program, but I think it would be a, an interesting point of discussion. So to conclude, some takeaways. Um, first, emerging programs and new entrants, I prefer to speak about new entrants rather than emerging uh, programs. So government new entrants are procuring increasingly complex space systems and they require uh, larger financial commitments and so the complexity of the systems is really increasing over time. There are multiple funding models. There is not one fits all. I think it was said as well this morning. I totally agree with this. It always depends on the national context of the country. It depends on the type of, project, of program. It depends on the objectives that the government is pursuing. Often there will be a combination over time. Uh, it's at some point a specific PPP might work and in the, uh, in the next phase maybe um, uh, vendor financing or ECA and so on. Often there is a combination of several funding schemes that make sense in the long term. And last but not least, as uh, it was said several times, I totally agree on this uh, statement as well. Space is, cut, is very much costly. It's uh, expensive. There is return, but it's costly. It's demanding. And uh, developing a national space program definitely requires long-term vision from the political uh, decision makers and sustainable funding. And without these two uh, uh, commitments, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. So the most successful countries are those who have been able to have this long-term vision and this uh, co consistency, long-term vision, and sustainable funding. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward for the panel discussion. Thank you. 
think, Steve, that was tremendously valuable to have data to help uh, support our discussion and a, a framework for, for the problem. So I invite you to please come and have a seat. Um, and uh, I'd like to get Steve's thoughts on uh, the results of the poll question that you've all responding to. Are the results of the poll question uh, available? Why don't the remainder of the panelists come on up while we're waiting for that? Uh, okay. So regarding the question, what is your view regarding the opportunity for private sector to co-fund space exploration programs in the future? The uh, most popular response was possible and likely in the long term once pioneers will demonstrate the business case. What are your thoughts, Steve? I think it really makes sense. That, uh, that would have been my, uh, uh, my response as well, just because we don't see. Uh, uh, so possible and likely in the long term, once pioneers will demonstrate business case. The question is what we mean by the long term, but uh, I totally agree with that statement. Um, very marginal, obviously. Um, yeah, possible. The, the key question when we mean uh, public-private partnership or space exploration is what is the return on investment for the private sector? Because when we mean, it's not only about partnership. If you are speaking about a real PPP, there is co-funding, there is risk sharing, there is an incentive, there is a return on investment, and so on. So how do you materialize the return on investment? And uh, what kind of, um, uh, yeah, what is the return on investment in terms of data, in terms of a market that you can access and so on. Uh, obviously, it's very much demanding. So that's really the key, uh, the key, uh, uh, the key question here. But uh, so, but I agree with the uh, with the uh, with the response of the uh, of the audience. I think that's, that's that makes sense. Terrific. Thank you. So now that our panel has joined us, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Zong Penghua. He's the head of the International Business Department of DFH Satellite Co Limited and is responsible for international market development and international cooperation coordination. Okay, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, we're from China, Dongfang Hong Satellite Company, and in China we're also known as National Engineering Center for Small Satellite and uh, its applications. So you can see from name, we play a very important role in China's uh, small satellite uh, <coughs> programs, uh, actually almost all the most important small satellite programs. Last year we launched uh, 21 uh, satellites into orbit that make us the total delivery up to 90, 90 satellites. And this includes uh, uh, international cooperation satellites. I think this is the reason why we are here. Like I wanted to share some engineering, engineering uh, examples uh, concerning to this session. Now we are carrying to a very special project for our uh, international partners, one is for Ethiopia and another one is for Egypt. Uh, the two satellites uh, are in charge by DFH Satellite Company and our partner provide launch service and uh, ground stations. All this work is uh, financial, uh, for financial support by the Chinese government that means uh, the Chinese government will pay for the uh, project. Uh, also, the satellite is uh, part of China aid for, the, for addressing the global climate uh, change. And uh, for the Egypt satellite, um, based on the capability of uh, Egypt, we will set up a joint team work together. And the satellite AIT work will finish in uh, Egypt. Uh, actually, uh, for the financial uh, Limit problem is not always faced by emerging countries, also faced by uh, countries who have lots of experience. Uh, you know, comparing to our uh, space uh, space uh, missions, the financial always limited. So international cooperation is a very important way to solve these kinds of uh, uh, problems with the support of CNES, RC, and uh, Netherlands and Space Organization uh, there are several, several payloads on board on our satellite. We work together 
the payload, the platform work together to complete the missions. So for as industry, we are quite open and uh, we are uh, would like to dis discuss with our partner to find ways to serve the, these kinds of solutions to achieve the goal to finish the work together. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, you also uh, provided a poll question. China confirmed that it will extend financial support to Africa during the 2018 Beijing Summit yes. of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Do you know how much it is? What, are the, what, did the, what does the audience think? Right now, it's leaning towards 40 billion. What, <laughs> what, uh, what were you expecting? Actually, the right answer is a C. We, we plan here just to, uh, uh, wanted to, uh, uh, to see to our audience that uh, there's lots of this kind of situation. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not China. When we go uh, see uh, the project uh, implemented in, in, in other countries, like some like UK or some, uh, some organization in, in Europe, they also provided this kind of uh, uh, aid project to, our, to other countries. So I think we should, when we consider to uh, carry out our uh, project in emerging countries, we should consider this, this kind of uh, situation, this kind of uh, uh, money to use. Thank you so much. Our next panelist, is um, Mbaneni Muofe. He serves in two roles. One is the co-chair of the Group on Earth Observation and is the Deputy Director General for Technology Innovation at the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I think the, the comments have been made earlier on and, and I think now that space is a very expensive uh, area to invest in. And, and I think the one thing that we need to start asking ourselves is, what is more affordable? Is it investing in space science or not investing in space science? Because ultimately, I think uh, one of the most common thing amongst the countries, whether you're developing or developed, is that the use of space products is actually just growing. Everybody's spending money in purchasing these uh, products, etc. And, and I think the approach that we have been using in South Africa was to say, how do you actually position uh, yourself as a country to maximize the investment in space science and technology? And the one thing is to know what you mean by space science. Space science means a lot of people to, I mean a lot of things to many people. And it also means a lot of things to many countries that are different. And unless we extract ourselves from the technology and start looking at what space science does, then we can actually begin to think about how do we invest in space science and technology. So, so the one thing that uh, we have been looking at, for example, is what are the everyday things that are enabled by space, which we are actually consuming as a country, and how do we therefore increase investment in those areas um, so, so, of course, then you, you end up in a situation where government does become the driver in terms of putting together the first or the investment that then stimulates the rest of the, of the, of the investment. So, the, the thing therefore becomes people who are involved in the sector to know how to communicate so that you can actually be able to get the necessary investments. Now, I, I look at um, a number of options that you can you can really begin to think of. Um, somebody did mention here some devastating uh, flooding that is happening currently in South Africa as you sit here in one of the provinces. And you need to therefore say if you have got um, space-based technology, you can actually get a help in terms of how you plan your evacuations, etc., and mitigation of the disasters. So those are the kind of everyday things. Now, therefore, that means when you do various government planning, we need to begin to think about the infrastructure that is going to be supportive of government goals and objectives, including currently the fact that globally we are looking at dealing with sustainable development goals. And those 
can only be enabled to a greater extent with the use of space. So, so then you begin to use that as your rallying point and your investments are therefore very crucial. And I want to really say the, the so-called uh, greenhouse approach in terms of uh, funding model, where you're saying as government we're going to put certain investment down so that you can then be able to attract just as much as you talk about infrastructure for economic development. Space infrastructure is quite crucial in doing that. And, and you need to therefore when you plan think about if we are saying we need to grow our economy, we need to uh, build roads, we need to um, build telecommunication infrastructure, what role is space infrastructure going to play? Because if you don't have it, um, you will not be able to grow even your space sector. I mean, the initial presentations to the partnership that will include the private sector. Now, in most developing countries, there might not be as much of a private sector to speak about because maybe the infrastructure to allow the private sector to thrive isn't there. So the investments are therefore quite crucial in dealing with that. Now, the one example I want to put forward is that um, a few years back, uh, South Africa has about 4,000 kilometers of coastline. So a few years back, uh, government decided, look, we need to maximize the input of these oceans into our economy. And we started discussing about how that is going to be done. And we decided that one of the things that we're going to put forward is that space science needs to be central to allowing us to extract a maximum value from our oceans. And as a result of that, we were able to secure a lot of investment to put into uh, uh, the space science, the manufacturing of a small size satellite, but also beginning to map out a program, national program that will begin to look at space science as being central in ensuring that our coastline can actually, our, our oceans can actually contribute more in terms of you just looking at um, whether it is exploration for resources, oil, etc., then you actually can do that through space science. So that level of engagement of looking at space science, not as an outsider when you plan various economic policies, but as part of the centralization of policies, that's very crucial. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our discussion <laughs> as this evolves. Our next panelist is Talal al -Kaisi. Uh, he's the advisor to the D Director General Office at the UAE Space Agency. In this role, he supports the activation of the UAE Space Agency Investment Promotion Plan and the development of a local space economy in the UAE. Thank you. So um, many of you might have been here earlier today when His Excellency Dr. Mohamed al Hibabi, our Director General, spoke a little bit about the space agency and uh, the, the relatively uh, uh, young agency that we have in the UAE. It, is, it was established in 2014, so we're still in the process of learning, but we're also doing things very quickly. We have a Mars mission, we have an astronaut program, and multiple other types of initiatives that um, you know a few years ago wouldn't have seemed uh, realistic for a country like ours, a small country with nine million in population, one million locals to be able to do. The the sometimes when I when I talk to new groups, I try to emphasize the why before the how, and the why for us is similar to the why that we get in the space industry um, all the time. Why not spend the money we're spending on space here on Earth? Why not um, be focused more on the issues that we have here? And, and to me, I look at it from the UAE, van UAE leadership's vantage point, and the political will that we have to invest in space uh, is, is a product of a, a natural evolution that we've taken um, uh, in, in terms of diversifying our economy away from a hydrocarbon-based economy. So that natural next step for us with all the different sectors that we've been investing in uh, was only going to drive us towards space sooner or later. And I'm happy to say that it it, it happened on the sooner end. We're a country that's only um, 49 years old. We're, we're, we're going to be 50 in uh, 2020, uh, 2021. So it, it's something. It's a, it gives us a sense of pride that we're be, we're able to partake with the big nations in this type of a domain. Now, diversifying the economy was a, a key pillar and a key decision and uh, a key reason that we had the decision <coughs> to enter the space economy. But. Um, the other thing is, when you look at the projects that we have, whether it be the Mars mission or the astronaut program, uh, the, the uh, applications that we can get from space that could potentially in the future be utilized to support 
us on Earth, but mainly w w the way we look at it in, in the UAE is the similarities that we find with, for example, the things on, on Mars. If you, uh, our, our probe is going to be looking at the atmospheric, uh, uh, you know, cer certain intricacies in the atmosphere on Mars. That type of knowledge that we're able to gain would be useful on Earth because there are lots of similarities in terms of water, uh, food, and energy on Mars. So the Mars 2117 program we have, a 100-year plan to build a habitable settlement on, on Mars, is, is directly targeted at those three areas so that we could solve those hard challenges there and then try to figure out um, how, how those same challenges on Earth could be, could be solved, in particular in our region. The third, uh, the third area I think that's important is a geopolitical one, and I think our leadership was very focused on the, ge the positive geopolitical ramifications that we could have by entering the space, uh, space uh, industry. Um, to us, we look at the region as one where there is no shortage of negative news that comes out, and uh, very unfortunately, and we're looking at space as a way to generate some positivity. There's a lot of youth, very talented, with unrealized potential that we need to be on presenting uh, the right opportunities to so they don't gravitate towards that negative uh, message and, and dialogue. And so part of what we do is, is present that opportunity to uh, allow them to derive a sense of purpose from something positive and encourage them into STEM education. So those are the three pillars. Now the how is in how, not, not just getting the big projects like a Mars mission and astronaut prog programs are costly, but how do we make it sustainable? And to make it sustainable, we have to have some sort of a, a clear um, uh, investment uh, type of uh, strategy to, to ensure that there is an economic return as well to continue to fuel this forward. And that's what we're working on uh, currently at the agency with an investment promotion plan that we've recently announced, which we will unveil um, in incremental steps. That includes things like um, special economic zones for space uh, companies, uh, different activities with universities to help enable them to generate some IP and, and be able to monetize that. Um, uh, things like turning Al Ain Airport uh, into a spaceport, hopefully in the not too distant future, to where we can have uh, companies operate from there as well. So lots of exciting different things that help us build the ecosystem and unlock the full economic potential of space and play a role to contribute positively to the, uh, to the uh, global space economy. So that's in a kind of nutshell what we're doing and why we're doing it. Terrific, thank you. Um, we, uh, we have your poll question here. So. In your opinion, what type of an architecture or concept that is missing is most feasible to further reduce the cost of access to space, and if existed, could be a valuable company that investors would be attracted to? Are you, would you, yeah, your you thoughts know, here? I think, to me, yeah, see, it's going up right now. <laughs> no, all of the above is, uh, was supposed to be on top and become all of the below, but, but there is no wrong answer in that, because satellite servicing and refueling is probably the low-hanging fruit, so I would agree that a lot of the crowds would have gravitated towards that. Uh, I think more and more we're going to see additive manufacturing and autonomous assembly in space, um, which could be a potential, potentially a product of the initial step of satellite servicing and refueling, so those are two very exciting areas for me. And then the inevitable eventuality down the line would be propellant depots to help reduce the cost further. That's definitely a little bit more out there in terms of time horizon, but, um, but there's no wrong answer, so everyone's right. <laughs> Terrific. Our next panelist is your uh, he is the CEO of JKIC, a company that advises government authorities, industry, and investors on commercialization, partnerships, early stage finance, and strategy development. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, actually, um, contrary to my normal strategy in these kind of panels, I made a, couple, a number of notes today because I found it very interesting. Um, talking to you as a as a space techie by background, and then having spent a lot of time in venture capital and strategy advice and developing development of financial models, I made a couple of observations today. And uh, in, the, in looking at the theme of the session, financial models and resourcing, and uh, I think the session lead text mentions the return on investment and the value of investments, um, and how to categorize uh, all these types of things. And what are the boundary conditions for that? I think it is, would be important to define what is an emerging space nations because there's quite a, a number of them. 
um, which uh, are at different stage of development with different focus. You know, is Singapore still an emerging space nation? The UAE is one. Uh, uh, all the way goes to Mars. Uh, after a short period of time, there's a couple of smaller sp emerging space nations, but I think the, the theme, uh, financing models and resourcing, that uh, addresses all space-faring nations, because I think uh, the financial challenge or financing challenge is all across the sector. And um, up front, uh, maybe a, a few statements. Uh, I personally believe um, financing shouldn't be a problem. There's so much money out there, more than we can spend, and the uh, financial markets and the financial industry is sitting on ex excess liquidity, number one. Um, the other thing is we are a bit self-centric in our community. We pay little attention to what's happening outside of space. And um, see, a mega projects, kind of multi-billion dollar infrastructure, utility, you name it, kind of bridge type things, are being financed or more or less on a daily basis. And financing structures are being put together without any big problems. And there is a variety of models and schemes to do so. And there's even sources. Uh, sources you would probably not even have thought of. And I'm very thankful uh, because uh, Steve's intro was just perfect. He addressed a couple of these things all the way from the PPP. What is a PPP? A PPP can come in in, uh, in tons of flavors. And, um, and as he said, there is no one, one uh, size fits all or no such recipe to address that. Um, this morning we heard about uh, what is the right business model we need to find. And I think it is helpful to kind of go to take off into a bird perspective and figure out where are we, where do we come from? And historically, this entire sector has been set up along techno technological and programmatic lines. Budget-driven, government programs in the early days, and that is what went on for many, many years. And only recently, uh, the new space development, and actually uh, 10, 15 years before, the personal space flight uh, wave uh, early last decade, uh, changed the equation a bit. But at the end of the day, um, if you look at financing things, it doesn't matter what technology, what things. The um, categories and dimensions driving finance are the nature of the activity, the risk profile involved, uh, the lead times, um, the uh, financing needs. Um, but then it may flow down to certain technologies and other things. So it doesn't really matter whether it's a rocket, a bridge, or a, a utility, right? From a financing perspective, that doesn't really matter. Um, so what it is all about is figuring an approach by which you find a balanced risk-reward ratio for the stakeholders involved. But that, of course, requires, in the first step, you know who are your stakeholders, right? And where does the activity originate from and which purpose is it going to serve? Right? It's not like this where we build a satellite and uh, somebody has some money. No, that's not, that's not the right approach. I personally believe that's not the right approach. So it will be, as Steve basically said, it will be a mix depending, a case-by-case -case mix, which then has to be optimized. And such mix, a mix and approach has to be balanced on what we have on the table. And that is, in some countries, based on the national priorities, those can differ big time. It can be from national prey to sovereignty to space access to capacity building to nursing particular subsets of industry being complementary with the terrestrial industry which is existing and so forth. So what, what are we talking about? What finance? And then of course for a nation, for an emerging nation or for any space nation, it makes a lot of sense to figure out is this the activity we are financing? Is it a national one or it's a bilateral or multinational activity? Uh, it's, it, there will be big difference in looking at the numbers and where the money may come from. So, is, what are we financing? Is it space and infrastructure thing? Is it STEM or capacity building? We heard a lot about these things this morning. Um, economic stimulation. Are we able to kind of nail down tangible milestones and socioeconomic benefits and outcomes of all this? And then, as I said, uh, is it pride, sovereignty, and these types of things? I think it is very helpful if we leave our space cosmos, our little space circus, and uh, look at the things which now we even here in our industry, number one is the UN promoted uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. You know that. 17, uh, all the way from poverty uh, and these type of things. So all the stuff we're going to fight. That's one thing. So what are, or what is your belief, are the mega trends in investment in the financial industry? Do you know? 
I tell you, it's nine. So we have 17 sustainable development goals, and we have nine global financial industry mega trends, which are being served by uh, the financial instruments and model across the board. Number one is technology per se, and then we can discuss the subsets of technology. Number two, the millennials and the so-called ESG policies. Do you know what that is? That comes with the millennials. The millennials plus the um, uh, uh, the uh, um, eco uh, environmental, the social, and the governance policies. That goes together big time with the millennials g representing a huge generation of inheritance and big money is coming to the table shortly. That was number two, millennials and the ESG policies. Number three, demographic change and uh, longevity. So addressing market services, products, and so forth, so addressing these issues. Number four, the food revolution. Number five, water. Number six, waste management. Number seven, gaming. Gaming. Number eight, revamping infrastructure globally. And number nine, renewable power. So now think about what do we do? How do we look at space? Launchers, satellites, downstream application ICT, technology transfers, space access, human space flight, exploration, uh, mining asteroids, etc., etc. Compare those to the social, uh, uh, sustainable development goals and see what the investment industry or the financial industry does. And where's the overlap? And that overlap has to be found nation by nation, program by program, activity by activity. So, now it comes to finance. What is finance? Is it money? In space, in the, for a long time it was money. What does it mean? What type of finance? Equity, mezzanine, any title or other type of vehicles. Then all these kind of structures. PPP, we heard about that. Who knows about LBO, LBI, MBO, MBI. These, all these kind of leverage build-ups and these type of things. These are the models being applied on a daily basis outside the SOTA. Right? And that is where the industry or the sector is a bit short. We are kind of getting there. In some countries, it's well developed. And you see, when we, I had personally had the opportunity to be, be involved in helping structure the first space PPP, which was RapidEye. But later, we worked on the first financial modeling for Galileo, which then took ages. What would happen over the time? And that is why I'm personally very, very happy and confident to see time is playing for us. It's getting all more mature. The next generation leaders of this industry, look at SGAC and ISU, bring powerful business acumen, and they're kind of changing the equation. And um, so, and then we're talking development banks and all these guys, and all these guys applying the instruments I just mentioned high level. So in essence, the, um, the message to conclude, but for upfront one thing, when I came after my first space career into the financial industry in the early 1990s, I heard a saying, which I had to learn the hard time, is very true. Um, there are three ways to lose your money, do you know that? Number one is with women, that's the nicest. Number two is with gaming, that's the fastest. And number three is with engineers and scientists, that's the safest. And uh, that is something which, uh, which we re realized over time, but it has gotten much better. You know, business plans and even government programs, economic stimulation uh, means, etc., have gotten much, much better over the years. Um, so, in essence, what are emerging space nations? They're not all the same. <coughs> Financial sourcing comes last because first one has to know what to do. And what, what is it we need to know? To know it's um, because this morning I heard the three pillars. Uh, number one was resourcing, number two, capacities, number three, government, governance. I think financial resourcing comes last. And why does it come last? First, you've got to have a policy and a goal and a strategy, and then hopefully the means of communication and the culture and the people to make it happen and get the message across. Once that comes together, financing shouldn't be a problem because there's enough money out there. And the millennials and new means of funding will become more and more used all over the world. And we see this in, the, in a number of countries. And what is also interesting that many of the space, future space programs and activities can be financed in a mix of activities and models being blended into the terrestrial financing schemes. Um, lending from uh, uh, kind of uh, case studies and other models being applied in other sectors. And that is what we barely do. We, 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 we know about PPP, or we know a couple other things. We have 
Hertz Venture Capital. We know uh, we have good numbers, and that's a good thing now. Actually, the industry is generating numbers. Some were shared today, and people, companies like Rise and others generate super numbers. Uh, we heard this morning from TWC about studies uh, measuring the socioeconomic benefits, so we're getting there. So the measure is, and the ammunition for the politicians is going to be, where do we find um, the, the road and milestones to, do, to come up with tangible outcomes so that we free some money from the governments and then with that message go out to private sector co-funding and these types of things. And I think having said that, that's the, uh, the end of my little tale. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can we bring up uh, Jörg's poll question? How should your country or any emerging space nation embark on financing its space program or selected space projects, both national ones and as a contributor to international ones? Yeah, we asked this question to get a good feel um, and, and, and a reflection on, on, the, on the opinion in the room. Um, there was a time, or a number of the traditional space budgets were based on the GDP. And there's still a suggestion in some uh, governments to increase the uh, percentage of GDP to be put on space, etc. Not sure whether that's a bad thing to do, uh, but it's kind of a common model. Um, but I think the, uh, the message of people in the room is, is sort of um, obvious. Great, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And I realized um, we didn't uh, discuss uh, Mambeni's uh, poll question. Do you think we can bring that one back up? And while we're waiting for that, uh, the audience would like to submit any of their questions for the panel. Uh, we'll get those in the system. That was the one before, before this one. as soon as it's up. Um, so well, we have a few more questions uh, from the audience uh, into the system. Uh, one of the questions that I have for you all is um, uh, what, are, what are the macro financial trends that have the greatest impact on financial models in space? So we've talked the macro financial trends. So global financial markets are there. Are there trends that are, are going on there that really have a, a significant impact well, I think the, yeah, there is a, is a move like we had um, uh, when in the 1990s in space we were looking big Leo and uh, we are dealing with the overestimates of microgravity, right? And, uh, and the dreams on hypersonics, all this is coming back now with a 20 plus year delay. Uh, in the financial markets, it, it was the move towards software and then internet. And uh, then last decade, there was a little kind of a peak for green tech, right? So all of a sudden, people got um, very prudent about the environment, etc. But the green tech investments didn't pay off. So then that, uh, that wave came down a little bit. But it's very um, visible and a solid trend for over the last 10 years is uh, uh, our investments related to the topics I mentioned and which really support global sustainability and uh, address environmental issues and the big, the big challenges of the, of the planet. Uh, as we said, food revolution, uh, the demo demographic changes, and these type of things. And uh, the demography effects, that was already, particularly in the private equity industry, already uh, seven, eight years ago, a mega trend to develop services uh, s serving elderly people, you know, and that is continuing. So I think uh, if you make the link between uh, some uh, set up application downstream ICT, there's a multitude of things space can deliver to this. And I think uh, from that end, we would be, as one says in the investment industry, we could be sort of sexy to the, to the uh, uh, financial markets. That's the official term, by the way. Yes. Steve, do you have any thoughts there as well? I think if, if your question is, um, is uh, space, um, or space financing um, responding to or um, affected by the uh, usual uh, or the uh, financial, the traditional financial context uh, and fin uh, investors and, and overall financial context worldwide, I would say definitely yes. 
There, I remember in 2008 when there was the subprime crisis, there was a tendency in the industry to see that the space industry would be immune to crisis. And to, if, I don't know if you remember that, that discussion. So that, and that's true, the space sector was, was going on actually uh, pre pretty well. Um, but actually the, the effect was more like a, a little delayed over time. But since the early 2000s or even the 90s, uh, especially if we're speaking about the subcom sector, it's a, it's, a, it's a telecom sector. I mean, you have traditional banks, investors, uh, private equity firms, and so on uh, that are heavily involved, uh, that are looking at the telecom se uh, the satellite telecommunication sector as another sector, as energy and others, and they are dealing with this satellite business as they do uh, as any other business, responding to traditional means. Now, if we are speaking about that, that's really different from financing national programs, and this is where we have to, to, to dissociate. There might be some conjunction when an, uh, a country like Bangladesh or Indonesia is procuring satellite communication through a domestic operator, through regular financing, then there would be actually applications of regular financial models and financial assessments from the bankers and the, and the lenders and the ECS and so on. But if we're speaking about my space flight, launch, then we are in another world, and this is, this is really separate. But I would say in the traditional commercial space industry, especially telecom, even now I would say Earth observation, yes, if you can. Okay. Um, I, another question that really was prompted uh, by Mambeni's remarks is, is sort of the opportunity cost. Uh, you raised a thought about, uh, you know, is there, is there an imperative now to, um, should, should emerging countries be pursuing space programs or, or programs connected to space because they're at risk of lo missing out on opportunities as, as there's so much dynamism and change uh, that's going on right now. Would you like to comment a bit more on that? Yeah, uh, th th thanks very much. I think the, the one thing that I, I have picked up, and it also links to the previous question, is that um, th there's this move of financing being available for impact. So there, there are opportunities for impact investment. And then I think he has mentioned the um, ESG approach, uh, which is really quite crucial and we see is the drive behind uh, what we're trying to do through um, sustainable development goals. And, and the question that you have to, to ask is um, to understand that, for example, when you protect the environment, you actually um, are sustaining the very source of creation of your work. So you therefore cannot ignore it. So in, in whatever you want to involve, invest in, you need to think about um, is the very source of our sustenance going to be taken care of? That's one thing. And the second thing around that is that because of the demands in terms of what our investments need to go into, whether you're a private sector or a public sector, is people want to see that you are a, a responsible investor. They want to see that you take care of the societal aspects, inclusivity, so that by whether it is looking at how you share the resources and making uh, everybody prosperous because we have now a very um, educated or aware populace where the citizens expect to see the private sector, the government acting responsibly. So those therefore become uh, the driving forces. Now, if you want to think about whether it is affordable or not, let's really just look you know, we can reflect on all the presentations that we've done this morning and now and wherever. And starting from issues around food security. Now, we are unfortunately in a situation where the population continues to grow. The world has remained the same size and it will remain so. And we need to feed the people that are here. And we cannot do it the way it was done in the past. So there needs to be some investment, there needs to be a new way of doing your agricultural farming, etc., And a whole lot of these technologies, you then ask yourself, if we want to do it together as the world, 
there is no way that you're going to ignore space-based technologies and innovations. Um, whether it is around issues of infrastructure, etc., the planning thereof, you're going to need to do that. Because if you don't do it, you either find yourself in a space where you're dealing with a virtual cycle or a vicious cycle. Virtual cycle in the sense that when you start investing, you begin to also attract other things that span a wheel and a cycle of more investments and more prosperity. I mean, we, when we started investing in space science in South Africa, there were a number of opportunities that started coming through. I mean, people know that this square kilometer array project, coming with that, there's now a lot of investments around big data infrastructure. We're looking at how we can strengthen other aspects of space sciences. But those sort of things don't happen if you kind of sit and wait and do nothing. But the moment you start doing something, that is really where the quality of technology and innovation, and even as we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, is that you don't ride the wave, you actually get completely left out. And you don't want to be in that space. Exactly. Uh, would anybody else care to comment on sort of there being an imperative to start pursuing this path versus... Uh, I think maybe more than missing the trend, the neighboring effect in, in, in starting a space, pro space program procuring satellite assets is often a, a key driver. When you have a neighbor country starting to launch a satellite, Earth observation satellite, then the neighbor starts to be quite interested in wants to have his own satellite, but potentially even bigger. So we have seen a, a, few, a few cases. Indeed. Uh, yeah. uh, then I may also have one. Um, that's a very good point. And I think um, we talked collaboration, but there's also competition, isn't it? And um, so there's competition for the emerging space nations, uh, more than one may believe. Another thing, an overlaying impact is the geopolitics, we are, which are hard to control these days. So I think positioning a country in this, uh, in this context is not so easy. Um, another thing is uh, my personal observation, and having been dealing with a lot of countries on this planet, um, um, the, the younger the merchant nations are, or when you go into developing countries, they're, they're the divide between very rich and very poor people is, is even bigger, right? So, and um, uh, it, would, it could be an option, I know, from two countries, and one country is, starts also with an M, uh, where uh, super wealthy people uh, really help to bring the country to the next level also with space. And that is potentially uh, in some developing or very young or emerging space countries, maybe an initial step to uh, kickstart something. But then, of course, the challenge is to align uh, the individual visibility and pride with the national objectives. That's a, that's a kind of a, a, a challenge. However, uh, there is a lot of capital to be unlocked and, and support because often uh, these kind of families and people uh, have close ties to other countries, and um, be it on trade, be it at the government level, uh, be it with financial institutions, you know. So, that, and that, to my, uh, my understanding, is much underutilized. Um, speaking of competition, uh, how do space projects and programs effectively compete for government funding? Maybe Talal, based on your perspective, um, you have some thoughts there? How do space, pro how do space programs or projects compete against yes. other government programs for funding? Well, we're, we're very lucky in the UAE. We have a leadership that's um, really committed to the sector. And, and so um, we're, we're, we get the support needed to have the programs that we have. And I, I think, um, in general, it's, uh, it's easy to make the case as to why space could be useful uh, because of the ancillary benefits that are, are not inherently there when, when you see successful programs elsewhere and, and the benefits that, that that has yielded across across the board in terms of uh, what we benefit from. Um, in the UAE, I, I don't think it's a matter of trying to compete for that funding from the government with other institutions. I think on the, on the other side of the coin, you, you have a push to even drive and create our own competition externally and, and yield the benefits of, of that. So, I mean, things like what Dr. Hababi mentioned in the Arab Space Corporation group that was recently established with Arab, 11 Arab countries, um, you know, even going back to the last question, it's, it's not a matter of uh, us trying to do something and compete with the others. No, we're actually trying to enable that, uh, the other countries so that they could do the same thing that would effectively end up competing with us because it's for the greater good of, of humanity. 
And, um, and in our part of the world, there's also that other geopolitical element I mentioned earlier, where the benefits could be, uh, w would come from. So um, we're lucky, at, at least in the UAE, that we don't have to fight with a different institution uh, apart from the space agency and, and try to take funding. But what we do have to do is um, at some point in the future to ensure sustainability of the program because you're, you're only going to have so many Mars missions or astronauts if there's not going to be a clear path to economic return as well. Um, economic return can come in, 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 in many different forms, but for us it's important to look at the government and look at the government as, as a startup would look at a VC. And when you, when, you, when you have certain government programs that could start to generate a revenue, a modest one perhaps, you can go to them and ask for more if you could show a clear path to uh, uh, bigger revenue generation. So um, I, I, would, I would look at it that way rather than competing for funds. Go to them with, with a value proposition as to why they should be increasing the funding and scaling what's already working. Uh, okay. Zong, maybe you have some perspective since uh, uh, you have such a large program. Uh, how, how, have, how have you managed to uh, to set aside that amount of funding for, for these initiatives. So um, the, the $60 billion that is set aside, how, how has that been possible with maybe other initiatives uh, that are out there? Actually, as a funding, actually the funding I think uh, is, uh, is announced between China Africa firm that actually is not off of space. Like for like all several several uh, project and lots of uh, uh, like missions concerning to the sustainable development of social. But I think uh, space we should consider as a very important uh, high, high technology uh, application and uh, the Chinese government I think will support this kind of application. Okay, thank you. Uh, why don't we take a, a question or two uh, that the audience has submitted. Um, what can emerging countries do to, to create an environment that is attractive to foreign investment funds? <laughs> Anybody want to go first? You want me re I can repeat the question. What can emerging countries do to create an environment that is attractive to foreign investment funds? Yeah, thanks. I, I think the one needs to look at space as one of the many areas in which investments happen. So the, 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 the sort of creation of investor-friendly environment that you create for any other sector will be quite crucial. And one of the things is uh, the role of government in terms of making sure that you've got policies that enable the, the industry to grow. And the second thing is to make sure that the basic um, infrastructure is in place uh, to do that. Because one of the things that we, we're doing now in South Africa is to provide funding that leverages other investments. So you say, we're going to look into this sector um, and we put some government funding into it, which means that you then use that funding to attract other funding programs. Now. One of the things that we have learned the hard way is that you, you actually, at least in South Africa, you're not going to go and say, we want you to invest in space. Because that has got a completely different connotation. But when you begin to demonstrate that, look, we have got human settlement programs, we need to build houses, we need to do these things, planning around that, you can only do it well if you're using space-based uh, technology. And by the way, to indicate that we are actually using space-based technology, but we are buying it. Mm. So it will probably be much better if, whether in partnership or on our own, we sort of work together either with other countries and the private sector to begin to grow that space. So that way, I think when government begins to put in a little bit of something, you've got good policies, you actually have capacity, you train people. You've got to have programs at your higher education institutions where you produce graduate because people for people to invest they need to also have people who are going to be driving that particular area so that is quite crucial as well please um yeah uh, if you talk environment for an investment fund um yeah let me put on the hat of a fund manager so i did that many years ago 
and um, we're also training and teaching these venture capital and equity investment kind of things. It's very simple in my perspective. High level, it is all stuff and assume we wanted to have a fund which supports space and that would be probably uh, no more the typical venture capital fund model which comes to its limits nowadays. Uh, that is a very long story, it's more like uh, mechanical uh, in the industry, but a number one thing is for a fund manager to serve the limited partners means the investors and what is that? Repatriation of profits. And that is a huge thing. And uh, we discussed with a lot of countries and ministers and space heads of agencies that don't even know what that means. Uh, of course, it's not their business, don't get me wrong. So the point is, uh, what, what drives these things? Another thing is the licensing, the regulatory, a favorable regulatory framework on the ground to quickly set up a fund and not to restrict the investment focus. Um, that is another thing. But, uh, and then of course the taxation. In some countries, funds just kind of die in trouble with the VAT stuff, VAT, non-VAT income and, and cost these type of things. So it's a lot of very uh, fund, investment fund, uh, mechanic type things. If, if they're a set, it can be easy to go. And as for space, I personally believe we see a lot of countries which have put up favorable environments for companies to come because also for emerging companies, it is a necessity and part of the international space activity to attract foreign players to the countries, right? As a sort of an infusion to the national economy to kind of build uh, these types of things. So there, it's, um, it, it's another challenge because um, we see some good schemes which are favorable for the com companies, but I personally believe it takes some additional investor incentives. So we have com corporate incentives, but we're lacking investor incentives. And, uh, and that is something which then would go together. And whether that was on the fund side or on the limited partnership level, that's another question. But kind of investor incentive, and then the fund could be seen as an investor too. You know, so that is a, it's getting very technical then, and it depends the jurisdiction. But that is actually where the governments need to work. Okay, well, uh, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, thank you so very much, everyone here on the panel. Please give them a, a round of applause for sharing their thoughts with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Kirsten, and all the panelists for this outstanding panel, very interesting. Um, and before we now move to the welcome reception, I would again ask you to stay with us for a few more minutes here up. Uh, and it is my distinct pleasure to announce that we also have sponsors for our welcome reception. And this is Thales Alenia Space and Telespazio. It is now my great pleasure to invite on stage the representatives from these two sponsors, uh, Mr. Jean-Luc Gall from Thales Alenia and Mr. Jean-Marc Gardin from Telespazio France. Hello, hello again to everybody. So um, the day has been uh, has been very long, very rich, especially the last the last one was very interesting for me. Who is not a financial guy, um, so but also a tiring day. So I will not bore you with a, a very long speech uh, about my company, what we can what, can what we can bring, our strength, our products, our systems. Uh, you will have a very small movie of uh, three minutes, uh, which is quite uh, beautiful, and that would be much better than my, uh, my speech. Um, I am here with my sister company CEO, uh, Jean-Marc Gardin, uh, TAS, Thales and Space, in charge of uh, infrastructure, space infrastructure, and, uh, and Jean-Marc, uh, Telespatio company, is uh, in charge of uh, space services. Um, I just want to tell you that uh, we, uh, we would be close to you in order to support uh, the development of your space activities in your country if you have a willingness to do so. It's not just word. We did it in the past. We did it in Korea. We did it in Argentina, which is able now to 
to develop uh, by itself some uh, uh, telecommunication satellite, and we are uh, doing it currently in Brazil, who has, uh, which has decided to launch uh, a, a very uh, uh, comprehensive space uh, program. Uh, so my company is uh, really here to support to support your country to to develop to develop also your space industry, and we discussed during the day that the, the barrier to, uh, to entry are, are shrinking. Just a last word, uh, but I would like to share and to seize the opportunity of such, uh, such a worldwide audience. Uh, during all the days, I think we are all agree about the fact that space was amazing, that space will uh, support economic growth, that uh, space will be probably the future of humankind. Uh, we have, and I hope that the emerging country will support the, the big uh, space power to tackle one important problem, which is uh, the removal of space debris. And today we are not tackling it very seriously. At least it is my view. And uh, I think that in the short, uh, in the short future, Together, all countries, big space powers, emerging countries will take care of this problem because we cannot live tomorrow in space if we don't fix this issue, which is greater and greater. Thank you, and I leave the floor to Jean-Marc. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Luc. Uh, so, uh, you have understood that Thalesinia Space is uh, focusing on uh, satellite infrastructure. Telespatio is focusing on the midstream market and on the downstream market. Uh, so, really, uh, our focus is to develop new solutions, new services, uh, of course, in the midstream market for the agency, for the operator in space, but on the downstream market, I would say, of course, outside of the space uh, activity for the users. And really one of my key messages I want to, to give you just before the video, you, you will see some example of our activity. Uh, we deliver services in the three key area of, of, of space uh, activity, navigation, telecommunication, earth observation. Uh, this field is of course very big, very vast, um, but we are very lucky because we have discussed uh, during this very interesting day about uh, all the complexity of uh, investment in space, all the difficulty to develop uh, a, a new activities in space in, in, in emerging country. Uh, but globally, the downstream market is evolving a lot. Normally the forecast in the decade is to double the worldwide market, so from 50 billion to 100 billion. So it's a huge number. Uh, so it's really very key to be part of this uh, uh, very important booming market and to have the good approach. Why this market is booming? First, because we have more and more excellent uh, satellites with very key performances that enable us to reach new solutions, to reach new performances. And second, for the downstream market, of course, and it has been uh, uh, also explained, uh, because of the impact of the digital revolution that enable us to compute all this data, all this capacity, uh, with very simple and very uh, competitive solution. So by combining these two elements, performances and digital revolution, I think we can bring new services, new solutions. Telespatio is working on services since 50 years ago. Uh, you can see in the, in the corridor of the hotel, CRTS, which is a co-organizer of, of this uh, very interesting uh, uh, event, uh, as in Earth observation, many fields of activity. Uh, so one key leverage I would like to stress is to work not in an isolated way, but really to partner, uh, to be sure in the different verticals of the downstream applications, uh, we are working very close uh, from the user uh, and by partnering with a country, with a, a, a new area, uh, we, we, we understand exactly what is the need of the user and of course, we bring our expertise in the space area, and, and we do this bridge between our space expertise, all the assets of the digital revolution, and, and the, the, the work, the teaming work 
uh, with our uh, user, our partner, uh, to develop new services. And I really think that we are really at the beginning of this story. Of course, the majority of the downstream market uh, that we will have in the years to come, if this market is doubling, are not existing today. So it's our responsibility, I think, to invent and to push uh, this very interesting trend and, and, and to, to work together. Um, just, I, I want to give you an, an example. Uh, Morocco has now two fantastic uh, Earth observation uh, satellites that will enable uh, the country to develop these new services in Earth observation. We have some reference uh, in Europe, for example, on, uh, I take uh, one example, maritime surveillance, uh, where we have uh, some important activity to, to monitor uh, maritime zone uh, in, in, in France, for example. Uh, how we can adapt these existing services to the need of Morocco using, of course, the data of the new satellite of, of Morocco and working together here in Morocco to be sure, I will say after a, a transfer period, uh, Morocco has its own solution which is totally adapted uh, to its needs. So I think it's a trend uh, we have to push in all the area on the downstream if we want to develop this market. And I let you just see this uh, short video to conclude.
Thank you very much once again, Mr. Gard and Mr. Gardai, for your support and for the interesting video and uh, your uh, interventions. Once again, also a big thank to our moderator and the panel here. And now I would like to invite you all to join us for the welcoming reception. Uh, welcome reception that is outside the pool area. Uh, let me just ask you one thing for those who have ordered a gala dinner ticket, who have paid for a gala dinner ticket, please collect it at the registration desk. That will help uh, to facilitate the process. And then we would see each other tomorrow again here, if you wish, at 9.30 in the morning to start tomorrow's program. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Steve, what, what do you think the, uh, the numbers of 